everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for Teledyne ISCO's August Chromatography Webinar focusing on peptide techniques for PrEP HPLC. <coughs> Today's webinar is being led by Jack Silver, one of Teledyne ISCO's application chemists. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please utilize either the chat or the Q&A function within the Zoom platform and all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And at this time, I will turn it over to Jack. <clears throat> uh, good morning, uh, everyone, or uh, well, it's still morning everywhere. Um, I know that we were talking about flash chromatography and we will cover that as well, but we will expand uh, the topic a little bit and for general PrEP HPLC. So our agenda today is an overview of what we're going to talk about, which we are in now. We're going to discuss method development, and this applies to both uh, PrEP, HPLC, and flash chromatography. We're going to talk about DMSO and other strong solvents and how it affects your purification. Uh, we're going to talk about pre-purification, on-column dilution, and dissolution in the large solvent volumes. These are techniques for working with DMSO and uh, strong solvents. So uh, moving on uh, to method development, uh, we'll have an overview, how to generate focused gradient, and the information one can gain during method development uh, regarding sample solubility and sample loading, which affects how you load your sample. And the problem is uh, people have an HPLC and they run a scouting gradient. They see their peak elute, and the question is, how do they develop an efficient uh, method. So uh, in this example over here, you see the peak, and uh, the peak elutes uh, at about oh, 5.8 minutes, and it looks like it comes out at 100% B solvent, but we all know that compounds rarely elute at that. The question is, how do we determine the actual solvent composition that elutes the compound? In this case, it's about 85% uh, solvent. And uh, stand by. Okay, there we go. Uh, so our need for a preferential gradient is we want an efficient purification. We need a method that's very easy to develop, and we want to use minimal solvent, and the purification needs fast, needs to be fast and use a minimum amount of solvent. Uh, one thing that uh, we will discuss in these several different methods is that we require matching analytical and preparative columns. What does that mean? It means that Running a phenomenics analytical and a water's preparative column will not generally work well. Uh, the techniques that we're going to talk about here apply to flash chromatography, and we do have UHPLC and analytical columns that match our flash columns so that you can run these experiments in uh, reverse phase and translate them to a Teledyne ISCO flash column. The first method uh, that I see uh, in customer labs is uh, take scouting gradients and uh, divide them up into zones. The uh, reference is in the lower uh, right portion of the uh, slide here, but you take an analytical scouting gradient and divide it into typically about five zones. The zones have to be empirically determined with a uh, series of test compounds. And for best results, again, use the same column chemistry in PrEP and analytical. Its advantage is it's very easy to do once it's set up, uh, but the gradient isn't optimized for any particular compound. If you take a look at uh, zone number two that goes from 20 to 40% B, the second peak uh, in that zone will elude very late. Uh, in zone number uh, four over here, uh, that goes from 80 to 100 percent B, you're going to have a compound that elutes at uh, very early off of the gradient. 
it takes a bit of time to determine the zones. And if you have multiple columns that work with your preferences system, you're going to set up five or more methods for each column used on your preparative system. Another commonly used technique is something called the accelerated retention windows, although this goes under several different names. And uh, it's actually you know, fairly common. I have some references uh, listed in the uh, lower right corner. But how it works is you run uh, several compounds in an analytical scouting run. Then you run a scouting run on the preparative com uh, column with the same compounds. You then correct the preparative scouting run gradient for dwell volume. You have to determine an equation from the graph on the right uh, to calculate the solvent uh, elution composition. And then after you do all of that, you have to determine an additional delay that uh, was called delta using a focus gradient with a model compound. Then when you run your sample, you have to go to the, a calculation, a linear freight, and you have to add this uh, delta to determine the solvent composition. In the equation, the values of M and V are the slope and intercept of the line in the graph that I've shown. RT is the retention time on the analytical uh, column, and this value delta is determined by trial and error and it varies between different columns and different instruments. We've created something called time on target, and it allows calibration of an analytical scout gradient to a preparative system. We run a test compound and elute the conditions uh, so that the compound elutes at the desired retention time. Our analytical column uh, is used in step two with matching chemistry. You run the scouting gradient with the same compound and solvent system as the prep. And the compound is presumed to elude at the same composition as in the isocratic prep run. Again, references for this are in the uh, lower right uh, corner over here. And we've applied this to a focused gradient generator uh, on the AccuPrep. We can run a very fast scouting run you touch the peak to be purified, and you get a uh, efficient focus gradient. And we've simplified uh, this on the AccuPrep so that you don't have to do any of the calibrations. We've handled it for you. So on our system, you select the column and scouting method. 150 millimeter long column will have a six minute gradient, and other column sizes will be in proportion to that. Uh, I'd like to use a 4.6 millimeter column uh, for this so I don't use a lot of sample nor solvent. After I do my uh, focus gradient, I can then uh, hit this button that says focus on it and it opens another screen and that allows me to choose the peak to be purified. I press the focus in this uh, new screen and it generates a focus gradient for me where the compound elutes in five to eight minutes. It increases resolution and loading capacity over a default gradient. Uh, we've programmed it to include a wash step and it can be removed for more time and solvent savings if you have a clean sample. And uh, the peptide runs used in this presentation all use the focus gradient generator. The flash chromatography runs were also calculated as well. So a scouting run can help you determine the injection technique. The retention time suggests a dissolution solvent, and it determined, you can use this to determine if a desired compound is water soluble. So uh, you can also see late eluding compounds which limit the total sample solubility. You can also look for very early, uh, the very closely eluding peaks, which reduce the potential sample loading because there's not a lot of resolution. So in this slide over here, there's a yellow vertical line uh, in the uh, focused in the scouting run that roughly divides water soluble compounds from compounds that aren't completely soluble in water, and it's typically about. 30% uh, B solvent in my experience. That yellow line you see intersects the gradient at about 90% B. And one question you might have is, well, you just said it was 30. Well, the apparent gradient delay 
is really that long. And uh, compounds that elude out over there elude in about 30% B. The two peaks to the left of that yellow line actually elute in about 10 and 20% solvent, respectively. Uh, sample injection. Uh, the problem we have with peptides is we have a mixture of polar and nonpolar compounds. No single solvent can dissolve everything, and not only that, on our PrEP system, we have a limited injection loop volume. This run uh, over here, this analytical run, uh, it's a scouting run of a peptide, and the arrows denote impurities. There's some arrows on the far right indicating those are very water insoluble. And then just to the left of the, uh, just to the right of the main peak, there's two arrows showing compounds that are due very closely to the desired peptide. And those would tend to limit the loading because you really don't have a lot of resolution on it. One way of dealing with uh, loading such a wide range of sample polarities is to use DMSO, that is D, uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, and dimethyl for amide, DMF. The advantages are very simple. It dissolves a wide variety of compounds, and you can concentrate the sample so that your injection actually fits into your sample loop. The disadvantage, as we will see, is that it affects badly the chromatography of polar compounds and can really limit the loading. <clears throat> In this slide here, we have a small molecule, a pair of small molecules, using a DMSO as the injection solvent. In the left chromatogram, uh, we injected one mil of sample, and we have a baseline resolution. The DMSO is the first eluding peak on the left, and we can see that we can actually load some more. So. I then injected the same sample two and a half mils. The peaks, the main peaks come out at the same time, but we lost the resolution. We don't have baseline resolution anymore. The DMSO tended to drag the sample down the column. If I can remove the DMSO, I can get a higher loading. So upper left is our run from the previous slide. Over on the upper right is the same sample, the same mixture, at the same concentration dissolved in water. The same injection volume was used as for DMSO, and you see that now we have our baseline resolution again. At the bottom, uh, we then injected four times the original sample, that is four mils. And so in a single run, we were able to do four times the loading as the original sample by eliminating the DMSO. Uh, this slide here, even though it's uh, flash chromatography, it shows what's going on inside the column. The chromatogram on the left <clears throat> shows a sample dissolved in uh, the B solvent. In this case, it was methanol. Uh, the sample ran down the column during the uh, first column volume, and you can see that it's kind of fronting down the column. It's got this nice uh, purplish-pink color. <clears throat> In the lower left of the chromatogram, you can see that there's a couple of tiny little peaks, and that's actually some of the compound that eluded out. And uh, so, and that it shows why the peak is fronting just a little bit. The chromatogram on the right is the same compound, same concentration dissolved in water. After one column volume, you don't see anything because the compound is still stuck underneath that yellow cap over there. And later during the run, you see the compound eluding as a nice tight band that's reflected in the uh, very nice symmetric peak uh, that you see. So how can we deal with uh, DMSO and DMF and still dissolve everything. One way is pre-purification on a flash chromatography system. Uh, it removes the nonpolar impurity. It removes some closely eluding impurities and it allows a higher loading for final purification. So uh, this run over here is the peptide that we ran earlier uh, with the uh, analytical HPLC. Uh, it's a 
fairly small peptide, but it uh, works pretty well. Uh, I could load 13 milligrams onto my PrEP HPLC compa uh, column. And you see, I just about have baseline resolution. I got eight milligrams recovered, and uh, the sample is uh, listed there. I then went and loaded the same sample on a flash uh, column. It's a gold C18 uh, uh, column. The sample is dissolved in DMSO. The gradient was similar as for the PrEP HPLC. I loaded 100 milligrams, so a pretty high loading. And I got 40 milligrams uh, collected from within the red box. I just collected uh, the different tubes. I then evaporated off the acetonitrile that I used, so the sample was dissolved in water, and then injected uh, uh, some of that material. Of the 40 milligrams, I took three quarters of it, and 30 milligrams was loaded, and I recovered 23 milligrams. So at the cost of about two runs, well, at the cost of two runs, the uh, flash and the prep run, I was able to do uh, the same as three uh, prep HPLC runs because uh, I washed away all of the non uh, the very nonpolar impurities. I could end this run at eight minutes and improve the throughput even further. The only reason why I let the run continue is just to show that we really did clean up all of the nonpolar impurities. Uh, you can see that the sample came off the flash column actually quite uh, clean and uh, it's rather pure. Another way of uh, removing, uh, of dealing with the DMSO is, or DMF is something called on-column dilution. It's a type of sandwiched injection. The sample is dissolved in your strong solvent and you sandwich it by a weak solvent. And air gaps can be used to pre uh, prevent precipitation and that's what just inject a slug of air. In this case, again, going back to flash columns, on the left are some very polar compounds injected in water. Uh, these are food dyes that are water soluble. In the left, they were dissolved in water, and you can see that the uh, uh, blue dye is stuck at the top of the column while the uh, yellow band dilutes. In the middle, I dissolved them in DMSO, and you see that the uh, yellow and the blue co and there's no purification. On the right, I used this on-column dilution. I equilibrated my column. I then <clears throat> injected a slug of water. Then I injected my mixture in DMSO, and then injected some more water to start eluding the DMSO down the column. And you see, again, uh, that it behaves pretty much the same as the first run. When applied to peptides over here, uh, I was able to load 45 milligrams of pure peptide dissolved in DMSO. Uh, over here uh, at the top, it shows a typical sandwiched uh, injection that's commonly run on HPLC systems. Uh, in this case, I replaced the DMSO that's between the air gaps. I replaced that with water. And so uh, it was able to prevent the DMSO from carrying the peptide down the column, and the air slugs serve to prevent the uh, precipitation of uh, any material. You can see on the far right, uh, we still have our nonpolar impurities, so we still have to do a column washout. <clears throat> Another way of dealing with uh, DMSO and DMF is to use something like a large sample load pump. If you Peptide is water soluble. It uh, acts like a giant auto injector. You can load a large volume that's larger than any loop. Uh, you can load the sample into the funnel uh, that's shown, or uh, we have a device that lets you suck the sample out of the column, and it's a semi automatic injector where you can inject multiple samples, uh, multiple injections from the same sample. So uh, what problem are we solving? Large dilute volumes of samples such as peptides. Uh, for example, you can purify your peptide with an ion exchange column. And then using the large sample load pump, you can desalt your peptide, concentrate your peptide, and purify your peptide all at the same time. 
After flash pre-purification, uh, when you need to polish the sample, you can just evaporate off the solvent before the preparative uh, injection. A synthesized peptide is often uh, dissolved in a strong solvent. You can load that directly onto the column. Uh, other water-soluble compounds work as well. Potential loading concerns. Sometimes compounds are loot in a uh, weak solvent. Uh, they're poorly bound to a stationary phase. Uh, you get early elution. They might wash from the column. And for such compounds, uh, something like a C18AQ type column would be better. Uh, very high sample loads can cause peak broadening, but it does work pretty well for pep peptides. Uh, in this case, I have this uh, very large peptide that's 3,000 Daltons. I loaded 75 milligrams in uh, uh, typical uh, A and B uh, water acetyl nitro TFA. I dissolved the peptide in 2.5 mils uh, acetyl nitro and then added water to uh, make uh, 25 mils total uh, sample. My loop size was only uh, 10 mils. I then filtered out that uh, mixture to get rid of the uh, insoluble uh, material. After my column was equilibrated, I used a large sample load pump to load the full 25 mils, and then I chased with 10 mils of water to get any last peptide out of the sample load pump and its associated tubing. And uh, you can see the chromatogram over here. I got a nice sharp peak at about uh, eight and a half minutes. That is my peptide and uh, ran uh, very nicely. Uh, after the run is complete, I put the inlet line for the pump into the uh, A solvent. Uh, you know, and I used the prime pump button to remove any salts and buffers. Uh, you can then use your B solvent to wash out anything in the pump that might uh, stick to eliminate carryover and finally reprime with the weak solvent. So, uh, conclusions, uh, we talk about uh, uh, method development for, uh, for uh, both flash and prep. Dissolving uh, peptides in strong solvents, uh, it's fast and easy, but it limits the loading of hydrophilic peptides and therefore it affects the chromatography. The alternatives to that is flash pre-purification, -pre uh, on-column dilution, and use of the large sample load pump. And uh, with that, uh, that ends uh, my slides, and we can start a question and answer period. Okay, and again, if you do have any questions or comments, please utilize either the chat function or the Q&A function within the Zoom platform. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, through Teledyne ISCO's YouTube channel early on next week. And I wanted to let everyone know we are always looking for feedback. After the end of the webinar, you will be directed to a SurveyMonkey to provide feedback on today's webinar and let us know of any topics that you might want to see covered. We're always looking for feedback and new ideas of information that you would like discussed. Let's see here. We have one question that's come in. Can you explain the details of sandwich sample loading procedure? Uh, that's a good question and uh, yes we can. <clears throat> on a flash column, it's pretty easy. I equilibrate the column, and then I would inject about two or three times my injection volume. Uh, I would inject about two or three times that volume in water. So if I have, say, a 5 mil sample in DMSO, I would inject about 15 mils of water. I would inject maybe one mil of air. Then I would inject my sample, inject another 15 mils of water, and then I would uh, inject a, one more mil of air and then start my run. On the flash uh, uh, chromatography, <clears throat> uh, I mean on the PREP HPLC system, it depends on uh, your HPLC. Uh, you might have to uh, kind of manually do the injection or you might have to uh, 
Uh, in fact, that's usually the easiest way because very often the uh, Sengrich uh, load is pre-programmed. But on the PrEP LC system, I would also uh, do manual injections with about a similar proportion of the uh, of the water to the DMSO. Next question, please. While we wait to see if any other questions do come in, I wanted to let you know that the September webinar topic for uh, chromatography will be our focused gradient. You'll receive uh, an email invitation on that approximately three weeks before that webinar, so early in September. The loading method would I suggest for the hydrophobic peptides? Uh, that's a good question, and it's one that I uh, had in mind and I just uh, kind of passed over. Uh, going back to that uh, uh, detail with the uh, yellow line uh, that we uh, had earlier, let's see if I could scroll up uh, to it uh, real quickly over here. But uh, <clears throat> if the compound is very uh, hydrophobic, uh, you can actually, there we go, I got it going now, I think. If the, uh, if the peptide is hydrophobic, uh, DMSO doesn't affect it anywhere nearly as much. Uh, so uh, compounds that are loot very laid out over here, you can dissolve them in DMSO or sometimes the B solvent. Uh, compounds <clears throat> that are dilute at around 50% B, that starts to be the changeover where DMSO starts to stop affecting the injection. Uh, DMSO is a stronger solvent for reverse phase than is uh, water, but it's weaker than acetyl nitro or methanol. Okay, next question, please. And if you do have any follow-up questions after we end today's webinar, uh, feel free to reach directly out to Jack Silver or through the Zoom platform to myself, and I will pass it along um, to Jack or the appropriate party. Okay, well, at this time, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thank you to Jack for his presentation and all the great information he shared. Um, again, this will be available through Teledyne and ISCO's YouTube channel. I encourage you to check that out as we have all of our previous webinars available um, on our YouTube channel as well. With that said, thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day.